good morning. I am Dr. Ritwik. I am a senior consultant cardiac surgeon at Max Healthcare in New Delhi. And uh, my area of practice is mainly adult cardiac surgery, cardiac transplantation, and uh, artificial heart and mechanical circulatory supports. And today, in this morning, we are going to talk uh, about uh, bleeding complications of left ventricular assist device and uh, mechanical circulatory devices. And we have with us one of the distinguished faculties uh, of around the world, uh, Dr. Vivek Rao from Toronto. To Vivek Rao, please. Thank you. So, um, just by way of introduction, I'm the Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Toronto General Hospital and the Peter Monk Cardiac Unit there. Uh, I continue to be the Surgical Director of Mechanical Surgery Support, so I run the LVAD program, uh, and that includes uh, ECLS, ECMO, et cetera. Um, been doing this for probably over 25 years now, so I've uh, amassed a little bit of experience with the various types of devices that have been introduced uh, to the world over the past three decades. So it's my pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Rao, uh, to start with, uh, uh, my first question would be, how do you think uh, the bleeding in left ventricular assist device or for that matter in any mechanical circulatory support devices, uh, how do you think uh, the bleeding complication is? How do you want to elaborate to our uh, you know, viewers? So, I, I think the perioperative bleeding, so this is, we are going to focus on the bleeding that happens at the time of LVAD implant. Um, the prevention of that bleeding starts preoperatively yeah. and patient optimization. Um, and that means not taking the patient to the operating room when they have right heart failure congested with their livers congested and the clotting factors are abnormal. So reversal of all of those agents. Uh, many of our patients who are coming to LVAD implant are on antiplatelet therapy. We don't stop aspirin at our unit. I know a lot of centers do. But certainly we reverse the uh, vitamin K antagonists such as uh, warfarin, and if there aren't any other uh, novel anticoagulants for atrial fibrillation, which is a common comorbidity in this population, uh, we wait three to five days to wash those agents out, depending on what our hematologists say. So again, before you enter the operating room, it's important that you set yourself up for success um, and don't force yourself into a bad situation trying to rush a valid, bad implant when you haven't medically optimized the patient. Um, in the operating room, then there are lots of things that you can do from a surgical perspective that can again um, help you with respect to perioperative bleeding. Um, there is nothing better than a fast and efficient surgeon who does everything technically perfectly. So uh, careful attention to detail where your uh, sutures are placed so you don't uh, rip tissues. Uh, and we'll get into the two specific and most common sources of bleeding with an LVAD implant. Um, and then, then, again, keeping the patient warm and protecting the right heart. Um, it's a bit of a vicious cycle because as the right heart starts to fail with these operations, the liver gets congested, uh, the clotting factors get impaired, the patients bleed, they are then transfused blood products, uh, and that in turn also contributes to ongoing uh, RV dysfunction. So stopping that cycle at the beginning is, is very important. I would say when I started off with the first generation pulsatile VADs, the most common and almost only source of bleeding would have been the aortic anastomosis. Right. Uh, I think with the continuous flow VADs, um, the, the younger surgeons have a bit of an advantage because the pressure on your anastomotic site is much, much less than we saw with the pulsatile VADs. And with continuous flow, we, we're not seeing that much bleeding at the aortic anastomosis, which isn't to say you shouldn't take care while doing your anastomosis, mm -hmm. um, but it is a bit more forgiving with the current generation devices. Which leads us then to the LV apex and how to manage the apex, particularly when it's hostile. Uh, and again, there are uh, surgical techniques to set yourself up for success, and there are surgical techniques which will almost guarantee failure. So the first thing is choosing your apical cannulation site properly and making sure that your VAD is not um, improperly positioned from its inflow cannula. Several recent studies have shown that improper inflow cannula positions leads to RV failure, and again, the same. Uh, sequence of RV failure, hepatic dysfunction, and bleeding. So choosing your LV apical site, um, uh, we tend to use it by echo guidance and we, um, we can visually estimate where we want to start with the ventriculotomy, but then we confirm it with uh, echo pictures right. um, to make sure that our apical site is, is right. proper. Um, not infrequently, you'll have patients who either have uh, acute infarcts or chronic infarcts with calcification of parts of their LV wall 
and you have to adjust to your apical cannula position to a different location. Right. Um, I tend to not use a different location if it's simply a fresh infarct and friable tissue because I think there are surgical techniques to um, deal with that. However, in a calcified apex, um, if you can go to an alternate site, um, and most typically it's either the inferior wall or a little bit more anterior than you're normally used to, then that's probably the safer technique. Um, I do have a lot of experience with LV aneurysm repairs back in the day when we saw a lot of these, so I'm very comfortable dealing with uh, calcified uh, endocardium and shelling out that calcified shell. Uh, the only problem with doing that in the setting of an LVAD implant is the LV cavity then becomes very susceptible to suction. Right. So if you do a big aneurysm repair, uh, decalcify the endocardium, um, you have to be careful that the cavity itself is large enough that you don't compromise the LV, uh, LVAD inflow filling. Um, so again, it's paying attention to detail, knowing what you're dealing with, how big your LV cavity is, um, how much flow the patient needs to maintain adequate uh, so, uh, so do you think that uh, the type of the left ventricular apex is an important factor in the intraoperative bleeding part? Uh, like I do. I think the choice of where you um, place your uh, incision will be important. Um, in the extreme example, if you uh, are grossly wrong and you enter the right ventricular cavity, which surprisingly is not that uh, hard to do. I've seen some of my junior colleagues do that. Right. Um, you don't do it with your initial ep epical ventriculotomy, but as you put the coring knife in and you come out, you see venous bleeding coming from right. your, right. your, your right. cavity and you know that you've got into the right ventricle because you've gone into the septum. So right away you know that you, you've already set yourself up for some problems. So being very sure of exactly where your ventriculotomy incision is, um, is the first step to preventing problems happening yep. in the future. Then our, everybody has a different technique of securing the apical cannula. Yep. Um, our preferred technique, uh, I'm going to call it a modified Columbia technique. Um, when I was a Columbia Presbyterian with Professor Naka, we used this technique and uh, I think it's a very good technique for ensuring hemostasis at the apical right. site. Right. And those are mattress uh, everting sutures. Right, yes. Um, so that brings the ventricular tissue up and everts it yep. um, to meet the apical cannula um, and to provide a good seal around the inflow conduit. Right. So, uh, what's your personal preference uh, for any kind of glue or any kind of material after you stitch up the inflow cannula inside the apex? Yeah, I'll be honest with you, our initial practice was to use tissue. Okay. Um, mostly for the uh, needle holes around the pledges that we use for the apical right. cuff. Um, we were not a fan of bioglue. Uh, we've, I'm proud to say I've never used bioglue in my life. Uh, I think bioglue has been shown to be persistent at the time of explant transplant and uh, can be very difficult to dissect. And also there have been case reports where bioglue can migrate through tissue and enter the circulation and potentially cause embolic uh, right. events. Okay. So for those reasons, we don't use uh, bioglue. More recently, we've even started to avoid using tissue uh, because again, we feel that it's a little bit more uh, challenging at the time of reoperation for LVAD explant transplant. So if we have good tissue, uh, a fibrotic scar, um, and there's no needle hole bleeding, then we're happy not to put any uh, additional topical sealants on. Um, in the setting of acute infarct or uh, a dilated cardiomyopathy who comes in decompensated. Right. And I'll, I'll do a, a segue here saying that the most common reason that someone with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy comes in decompensated is they have a, a viral myocarditis. And if you look at the core biopsies, many of these patients, if not the vast majority, will have some form of active myocarditis. Right. That makes their tissue a little bit more... Right. Um, yeah vulnerable to bleeding. So right. in those situations, we will use topical So Dr. Rao, if I give you like three types of apexes, apices, yeah. like one is a recent MI, right. recent micro infarct, and one is a dilated cardiomyopathy, it's a big heart, mm -hmm. and the other one is very calcified. To our young uh, surgeons, so what do you tell them to start with? An elevate program they are starting with. So the easiest apex to deal with when amongst those three are a dilated cardiomyopathy. I was hoping right. you would give me the fourth option, which is a chronic infarcted heart from an ischemic cardiomyopathy, because okay. those are the easiest ape disease to okay. deal with. Okay. Okay. Um, but the dilated cardiomyopathy is the first, uh, is the most simple form in, in the three choices you gave me. Um, again, you have to be wary that the muscle can be edematous um, right. and infiltrated with uh, lymphocytes if there's an uh, acute myocarditis. So again, take care with your bites and be careful not to pull your sutures through. 
The next one in that sequence would be your acute myocardial infarction. Uh, again, if you take wide bites and you're careful with your tissue and reinforce your sutures with pledgets, whether it's felt or bovine uh, pericardium, um, the tissue generally holds and then you can have a very good seal. Um, the most difficult challenge for the new VAD surgeon is the calcified LV apex. Right, right. Um, how to maneuver around it, how to choose an alternate cannulation site which is acceptable yes. and, and not detrimental. Um, and or dealing directly with the calcification within the aircardium. Right, right. uh, coming to the type of devices, as you just mentioned in the early part of the conversation that the earlier devices uh, are they different as far as the bleeding complication is concerned and uh, this, the, then the newer devices? Yes, uh, I think the, the, the pulsatility with the first generation devices put a lot more stress on the aortic anastomosis. Yeah. In the current generation of devices, I'm going to limit myself uh, to the, the devices that I've had the most experience with, are, which is the HVAD from Hardware, Medtronic, and the HeartMate 3 now from yep. Abbott. Um, they're very similar. Yes. The difference being with the first generation apical cuff that Abbott uh, distributed took up a lot more real estate on the heart than the, the HVAD. Okay. Um, Abbott has come out with a modified cuff, which is much smaller. It's still slightly larger than the HVAD apical sewing cuff, right. um, but it's certainly a, a vast improvement over the first generation um, apical cuff. So again, if you're looking at someone who has a calcified apex and you're looking for an alternate cannulation site, you usually want to take the smallest available real estate possible, well, which would favor the HVAD. So you mentioned in the early part of the conversation that you involve a lot of doctors and a lot of specialists, uh, sometimes the hematologist also yes. to optimize your patients. So, so can you just elaborate in quickly what help you take from them? Sure. So the, there are three groups of physicians, I'll say, that uh, are involved before we um, go to the operating room. Um, so we notify hematology if a patient has been on any type of anticoagulation, whether it's antiplatelet medication or uh, an anticonoral anticoagulant and make sure that the period of washout is sufficient. I mean, after, you know, doing this for a while, we know that, you know, three days is enough for Coumadin and five to seven days is usually yeah. enough for any yes. uh, novel yeah. anticoagulants. Uh, but if there's any concern, especially if there's a risk um, of stopping the oral anticoagulations, we get our hematologists involved to bridge them with heparin. The second group that so, we... Uh, uh, just a quick, sorry, quick, I, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. So you don't do it yourself. You always in, involve a hematologist? It, a it depends or? on the complexity. So okay. if it's okay. a patient who's uh, in atrial fibrillation, has never had a neurologic complication, and is on a Coumadin for atrial fibrillation, I'm very comfortable just stopping that on my own and going to the operating room okay. 48, 72 hours okay. later. Okay. Right. However, when you have somebody on um, uh, a Pixaban, who has okay. a history of LV thrombus and a history of embolic stroke, okay. where everybody's a little bit nervous just stopping the right, anticoagulation right. without a bridging effect, um, we then get our hematologists involved to help us with bridging with uh, heparin, the timing of washout and the timing of uh, heparin uh, coverage. Um, so the more complex you get, I think it, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not failure to seek help. And I think okay. it's, uh, it Thank should you. be Thank you. That's a very nice information. Yeah. To, to seek help. Now, coming to the interoperative part again, uh, so what is your second most notorious part after the apex in this whole operation? Which causes you the most you know, notorious night, you know, nightmares yeah. and yeah. other things? So again, there are, essentially with the LVAD implant, there are two sites of surgery. There's the LV apex and there's the yeah. aorta. Yeah. Um, as I said, with the first generation pulsatile devices, it was 95%, if not 99%, the aortic anastomosis that caused bleeding. Um, again, with those devices, they would suck from the LV apex. So you have more concern sucking air than you did bleeding from right. those devices. The pulsatile device is completely empty your LV cavity, so there yeah. is no pressure there whatsoever. In contrast, the continuous flow devices do not completely empty the LV cavity, so there is a little bit of an LV EDP persistent. Um, so you can get bleeding at the apex if you're not careful. Um, in contrast, however, because the uh, flow is now continuous at a lower uh, pressure, um, the aortic anastomosis is more forgiving. Right. However, you can still uh, have problems with the aortic anastomosis, particularly in patients who've had previous surgery where you had to um, navigate around previous vein grafts. Um, if the aorta is calcified in some areas and you have to, uh, again, navigate around that. Right. Yeah. And the same concern goes with uh, aortic calcification as it is with LV apical calcification. Yeah. If you're comfortable um, doing a decalcification and our directory procedure on the aorta, that's one option. Uh, in our experience, it's probably simpler just to replace the ascending aorta. 
Okay. Um, that'll take mm -hmm. you 10, 15 minutes to right. put a short graft in and then do a graft to graft anastomosis uh, okay. with your right. obed. Mm -hmm. um, but on the native aorta, um, you can get bleeding complications. I think it's purely technical if that occurs and uh, should be very easy to control. Now, coming to the most important challenging part of the VAD operation that after surgery. Right. So, in the literature, if I go in the morning also, I just went because I have to take an interview. So, they write that 50 percent of the patients and in some literature, some reports suggest that up to 80 percent of the people, they receive more than 3 units of blood, right. around 4 units of platelets and about 6 units of plasmas. And then uh, in some centers, they routinely used to open the chest, uh, right. keep the chest open for a couple of days. So, what is your unit's experience and your personal experience uh, as far as the post-operative, you know? So, I'll answer a couple of those questions uh, individually. So, with respect to intentional delayed closure, yes. uh, we do not favor that approach. Um, our concern has always been infection of uh, hardware. I know probably the biggest series that I've seen in literature is from the Allegheny Group in Pennsylvania yes, where yes. they advocate uh, delayed closure to avoid tamponade and yeah. have meticulous... 30% yeah, you know, of the cases it seems, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Prior to closing the chest. I think um, I agree with their supposition that don't close the chest while you're wet. Right. Um, but in contrast to leaving the chest open and going back to the ICU with an open chest, we simply stay in the operating room until we're happy that uh, hemostasis right. has been achieved. So we're not in favor of uh, intentionally. Having said that, have we done it in the past? Yes. Yes, in, in certain circumstances where we were forced to go to the operating room with anticoagulants on board because the patient and arrestor were having uh, a VT storm right. and you had no choice but to rush to the operating room. Um, in those situations, then we compromise and uh, pack the, the chest with sponges and, and take them to the ICU with the chest open. So it's a technique that can be used. It's, I wouldn't say that we do it intentionally, but I think it's something to have in your armamentarium as a, an option when you have uh, refractory bleeding following the implant, as long as you're sure that it's coagulopathic bleeding and not a surgical source. Right. Right. Um, I would say that in our experience, and, and I can tell you our own data, um, we, we re-explore probably 10% of our LVAD implants, which means uh, although we thought the hemostasis was adequate when we close the chest, we go back. Um, most commonly we find it's delayed. It's not immediately postoperatively. It's within 48 hours. Okay. Um, I can talk a little bit about uh, the postoperative heparin management. Um, we started out as per all of the manufacturer's recommendations to bridge these patients with heparin immediately uh, after we were happy that their chest tubes were dry. Yep. And what we found was that at around 72, 96 hours, a certain proportion of these patients would develop a delayed tamponade and when you went back and re-explored them, they had hematoma around their outflow graft. Okay. And my theory was that the heparinization led to a little bit of seeping from the outflow graft and a little bit of uh, metastatal hematoma collection. And that led to a delayed tamponade, particularly in people who had marginal RV function, who right. couldn't tolerate yes. any type of uh, thoracic compression. Um, we had a short period where we stopped heparinizing these patients. And we paid the price with the HeartMate 2 in that uh, we started seeing pump thrombus later down the road. So, uh, for just for a second, excuse me. So, you said that you start heparin exactly after how many hours of your surgery? Usually within 12 hours. 12 hours? Yeah. Okay. So, if we. And what is the. You would give, give a bolus dose? We don't. We just start with 1,000 units of unfractionated heparin in the morning after surgery. Okay. Right. So, the first day of surgery, we don't do anything. Yeah. Uh, when I round the patient first thing in the morning, the following day, we start heparin without a bolus. And when you start your anticoagulation tablets? If the patient is extubated on first day, we start yes. the anticoagulation the first day as well. Okay. And you see the bleeding before that or the INR test before that? Um, we, we see the INR get therapeutic and then we, but I don't think it's the cumin in the INR that causes that. I think it's the heparin. Okay. Right. Um, right. Because we have Good. patients who don't have the hematomas and they go home and they're weeks and months with cumin uh, at therapeutic levels yes. or sometimes super yes. therapeutic levels and they don't get that uh, meters yeah. down bleeding. Yeah. When we bring patients back for right heart cats and we stop their anticoagulation and bridge them with heparin, once a year we'll see a recurrent meters down hematoma because the heparinization has caused that. So I think heparin has a unique effect on the outflow. So one very specific question to you. So if I give you a preference between two things, like giving eight units of fresh frozen plasma versus factor seven, right. so what do you choose from? That's a, that's a tough question for two reasons. One is if, if the patient needs volume, then I'd prefer to give them blood products. So right. the FFP would, would serve the dual purpose there. Okay. Um, factor seven we have used in the setting of VAD patients, again, for extreme refractory bleeding. Uh, 
Um, we always remain concerned that factor seven will make them prothrombotic. Right. Um, okay. And we uh, would not use that with the HeartMate 2 device, for example. Um, so, you won't never use factor we, we seven? We never heart use factor seven in HeartMate 2 device okay. ever okay. since okay. the pump thrombus. Yeah, that's a very important up. take home message from us. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think with the, uh, the flexibility that the HeartMate 3 device has in terms of lack of pump thrombus events, um, you have probably freedom to use factor seven if required in those yeah. patients. So, Dr. Rao, uh, just a quick question. Did you uh, say this because of a personal bad experience of using factor seven and getting a pump thrombosed? Or you have just said this because of literature support? No, we, we've had the experience with uh, the HeartMate 2, um, again, before uh, it became widely known that they were prone yes. to pump thrombus. Yeah. Um, and there was a couple different things happening at the same time. Okay. One, it was an era where we weren't bridging them with heparin right. because we were trying to avoid that uh, mediastinal hematoma. Uh, we were running our pump speeds low, trying to keep the patients ejecting right. um, to try and prevent GI bleeding, which I think we'll get to shortly. Yeah. Um, and then thirdly, we had refractory bleeding and they got factor seven. So I think it was a triad of, of bad events where you didn't have heparin on board, you had low pump speeds, right. and then you gave factor seven, and then we started having thrombus complications on the pump. So if I ask you, uh, do you think that giving lot of plasma and products would compromise the right ventricular function also? I do. And I think um, I can tell you that at the beginning, even with the continuous flow devices and specifically with the HeartMate 2, yeah. um, we would see thrombocytopenia within 48 hours. Right. And so we would prophylactically give 48 units of platelets on all of these patients, even if they weren't bleeding, knowing right. that their platelet count would drop yeah. and yeah. that they would start to bleed, you know, six or eight hours later after they were in the intensive care unit. We've stopped that practice now. Um, we now measure platelet function uh, more carefully with a uh, platelet works assay. And if the platelet function is down and they're not bleeding, we still give platelets. Yeah. However, if they're not bleeding and the platelet function assay shows that you have adequate functional platelets, we don't prophylactically give platelets okay. anymore. And I think any blood product will have a cytokine release that will adversely affect RV function. So uh, now we come to the last part of the discussion. Uh, how do you think about the late complications of bleeding effect of uh, left ventricular or any other mechanical device. Right. So sadly, um, I think the late GI bleeding remains a problem for us in the field. Uh, I think uh, as surgeons, we can do our own techniques to get around the perioperative bleeding. Yeah. Yeah. The hematology colleagues have helped us with perioperative management of anticoagulation. But one thing that no one seems to have a solution for is the late onset GI bleeding. Right. And most series have shown anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of yes. patients within the first year will have uh, an admission to hospital for GI bleeding. Um, and that, become, that, be, that remains vexing for us. Uh, we had some experience with our nephrology colleagues who showed us, who told us that it wasn't uncommon for patients on dialysis to also have GI bleeding. Right. And so we, we did a study that was published in the Journal of Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery a couple of years ago looking at biomarkers and we found that cyclic GMP was a yep. predictor of GI bleeding. Okay. Um, so those patients who had GI bleeding following VAT implant had much higher levels of cyclic GMP and that was mirrored in the dialysis population. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't due to the device itself, but if you're on dialysis and you had high CGMP levels, you were also more likely to bleed. Okay. Um, I don't know any way to reduce your CGMP okay. level, so okay. I don't Thank know you. if there's a therapeutic strategy there. However, it may be a marker for us. So if you measure CGMP levels in your patients and they're high, then you may be prone to reduce your anticoagulation in these patients and to be on the lookout for these patients to have GI bleeding. So your index of suspicion is high. The, the last point I'll make about GI bleeding is what to do about it. Um, I think you're uh, obliged to investigate GI bleeding at the first presentation. I think the, the nicest study came out of Columbia recently. Right. Um, where they showed that if your first invasive diagnostic test was negative yep. and the patient was readmitted with a subsequent bleed, the yield of repeating your diagnostic test is extremely low. Okay. So mm -hmm. essentially, especially if it's a non-transplant candidate and the transfusion is less uh, deleterious in that situation, uh, the recommendation is simply transfuse the patient and get them through. Most of these patients don't come with frank GI bleeding. Their hemoglobins right. are, are dropping, dropping asymptomatically right, and right. you see that in clinic. So if you transfuse them with one or two units of blood every month, um, it's usually all they need. Um, more problematic are those patients who are you're bridging to transplant where you want to avoid um, right. any exposure to blood products. Uh, 
and uh, I'd be willing to hear what your solutions are because okay. we don't have good ones. Okay, thank you. So uh, basically, if I try to wind up our session, and uh, thank you very much. So uh, I think uh, the bleeding complication as such have not been reduced over the last couple of years. Right. It's almost the same and uh, it depends on the experience, the type of the patient and uh, definitely the type of the tissues we are dealing with. And of course, you said the long term complications of bleeding has remained same in the right. last, uh, I think, 10 to 15 years now. So I'll, I'll paraphrase that. I'll say I, I don't think we made any strides in the long term bleeding rate. So I think the GI bleeding with the continuous flow devices is, is the same today as it was 10 years ago yeah. when they were first introduced. Uh, I think there has been a shift to the perioperative bleeding, yep. primarily because what we've seen in North America and in Europe is that we're no longer putting durable LVADs in patients who are intermax category one and two, right. who are more prone to bleed. Yes. So we're supporting those patients with other. So that's a very devices. important point you made. Uh, so uh, you yourself you would not like to put a VAD in a one right. or two intermax. Correct. Okay. Right. We we prefer now. I'm going to keep That's contradicting, really different, different I'm, I'm different going to contradict myself here, yeah. but um, I will say that there, what we do know is that there's a shift to, to doing more Intermax 3, 4 patients than right. 1, 2. Yeah. Um, and having said that, our usual practice is somebody presents an Intermax 1, we would support them either with ECMO or yeah. a temporary VAD, yeah. um, get their, their end organ function optimized, and then proceed to a durable VAD durable, if they have yeah. no recovery. Right. Um, my friend, uh, Anyan Waku from Mount Sinai, has promoted the idea that do one operation and deal with that operation yeah, okay, right. once. Yeah. Um, and with his firm guidance, we've been doing that and we've had some good results by putting durable VADs in patients who we knew were not going to recover because they were on our transplant list and they were going to be bridged to transplant. So when they came in decompensated, instead of staging them with two different operations, putting the first device in, um, if needed, put a temporary RVAD in, but again, to decannulate an RVAD is a completely different operation at five to seven days than decannulating a BIVAD and upgrading to a durable LVAD. So I think if you've done the initial operation up front um, and supported yourself either with ECMO or an RVAD, your second operation, if needed, yes. is much simpler yeah. uh, and your patient already has a durable LVAD in place. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. you so much, uh, Dr. Rao. I think uh, we have a very uh, beautiful and a very uh, thoughtful presentation from Dr. Rao and we have learned so many new things and uh, new you know uh, protocols and uh, his tricks uh, from preoperative intraoperative post op and late post operative period i would like to thank everybody at cardio life and then in hlt conference committee for this uh, great interview thank you dr Rao. thank you very thank much thank you very much thank you